It is good to be back with all of you tonight. It's great to see each one of you. Uh, I'm starting to look forward to Sunday night singing. When we get everybody together on Sunday night, it is really good. It is wonderful to be together and be able to sing out. Clint did such a great job leading us. Uh, we've got some folks that might be a little bit tired coming back from CYC. It was a great weekend. Uh, I don't take time to brag enough on Ben McGreevy, but he did a great job leading us and appreciate all his work. We've also got an amazing group of adults uh, to feed that many kids this weekend. We all sort of stayed it, and a lot of times we would go out into the community, you know, go and see the strip and see all the things in Gatlinburg, but this weekend we just stayed in-house and got to spend time together, which actually was a great highlight for me. But that takes a lot of meals and feeding a lot of kids, and we had so many people that made that possible, and it was a really, really good weekend, and I'm so thankful for it. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We know we got some visitors tonight, and we want you to come and be with us any time that you can, and we greet everybody that is joining us online as well. I just got a text a minute ago about a prayer request, and I want us to go ahead and have that prayer uh, before we get into our lesson. Uh, Hannah Hill Mitchell uh, texted me just a minute ago and said that Randy's grandmother, Joyce Scroggins, uh, she had a turn in, the, in her health this weekend, and they've just taken her off of oxygen and said she didn't have much time. And she asked us to remember the uh, Miss Joyce Scroggins and her family as well. So I want us to remember her in prayer before we begin. Our great God and Father, we come to you tonight, uh, thankful that we can call you Father. Thank you for your love for us and for your grace and your mercy to us. Father, tonight we come as your children asking for a special blessing on Joyce Scroggins. We pray, Father, that you will bless this family during this time. Father, we pray that you will give them an awareness of your presence. Pray, Father, that you will strengthen them and help them to look to you uh, for strength during this time. We ask for a blessing of comfort. And, Father, we ask that you will uh, be with them in every way. Uh, we pray a special prayer for Randy as he's uh, going through this difficult time as well. And we pray that you will bless him in every way. Uh, we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever been excluded? Been excluded. As the youngest of four boys, uh, being excluded, that was something that was commonplace because you were the youngest. There was all kinds of things you couldn't do. We took one trip to Disney World, and I went up to the ride ready to drive the cars, and I was too short because I was in second grade, excluded. It's come all this way, I can't ride it. Then, of course, you have get-togethers or you go to, you know, whether it's a TV show you're going to watch or you weren't old enough to do something, you weren't big enough to do something. All the other friends came over and they were running around and you were the squirt that was running around. Now, my brothers would probably argue that I got to get involved in everything. Uh, but the idea of being excluded when you want to be a part of something and you can't is a difficult thing. Uh, whenever you start to think about your life, have you ever been excluded? You try out for the team, but you don't make it. Maybe you get cut. You're thinking about different times in school where certain people maybe didn't allow you to fit in with their group. Maybe some group at school was mean to you. They cut you out. Maybe they even mistreated you. They called your names. They weren't going to allow you to be a part of what was going on. I remember the year in high school that I didn't get the invitation to the party that I'd gone to every other time. And isn't that wild that years later you can remember whenever other people did something and then you weren't allowed to be a part of it? Uh, being excluded is a difficult uh, thing. Exclusion is tough on a person. There's few things worse than being left out and then the loneliness that can come because of that or how you start to question yourself or you may wonder why did other people not uh, pick me or make, allow me to be a part of what's going on. Uh, we have a phrase for fighting exclusion when it comes to young people. It's trying to fit in. You come to school and young people are really always thinking about how can I fit in. And they do it a number of different ways. And you have certain groups. And, you know, at school there's different cliques and different groups that are doing different things. And you're trying to fit in. Maybe it's in sports or in music or a club or whatever's going on. Whenever we're excluded, sometimes that pushes us to do other things that we shouldn't do in order to try to fit in. And that's one of those temptations where people will dress or act or talk a certain way trying to fit in. And really they can do things that they wouldn't normally do. Why? Because they, they have a desire to be included and instead they're excluded. 
And that's tough to teach our children and to teach kids at school. I'd always say, look, don't change who you are to make somebody happy that you aren't going to be around four years from now. But that's tough to understand when you're in junior high or you're in high school because you want to fit in and you don't want to be excluded. Now, you can make a lot of mistakes trying uh, to fit in. But we all understand the pull to fit in because we hate exclusion. And we wish that it ended in school, but it doesn't. When we grow up, there's still times where we can be excluded. Uh, cliques are still formed by adults. Uh, they don't always come from evil motives or trying to mistreat people, but just naturally speaking, what happens? Well, certain people of certain age groups are going to be together, and sometimes similar interests are going to make that happen. But what that can do is people can get together into that clique, and they can end up excluding people. A clique, obviously, is just a small group of people with shared interests or features in common who spend time together but don't readily allow others to join them. We are always able to identify a clique when somebody else has a clique, but a lot of times we don't identify our own, do we? Have you been a part of a clique? Well, I'd say everybody in here has been a part of a clique of some sort. Sometimes that's family, sometimes that's other people. But you have people with similar interests, and you say, look, am I trying to include others, or am I excluding other people? Uh, whenever people come to a new place, sometimes it's going to be individuals that are in a clique. Sometimes you may come in, and if you don't seek to engage, if you don't seek to get into a group of people, you can end up being excluded. And it was because, really, you never sort of stepped out of your comfort zone. Maybe you didn't go up and introduce yourself or talk to somebody else or try to get in with a group. Maybe it was, well, I don't know if I would fit in or not, and I don't even try. The reason I bring all this up is because the number one reason a lot of people leave a church, and I had somebody tell me this this weekend, well, I was at that place, but I just didn't fit in. And people can come, and they can sit here for a period of time, and if they don't find some people that they have common ground with, that they don't feel like they fit in, if any, nobody else has talked to them, and nobody else has made a deeper relationship, and if they haven't engaged and started to see what can I do within this church, eventually what happens is when people feel excluded, eventually they leave the situation, and that can happen. I remember distinctly when it came to this idea, uh, my very last year as a camper at Horizons, the future church leaders workshop at Freed. It was my senior year, and we had a group of guys there that were from Chattanooga. They were from Boyd Buchanan, and for whatever reason, teenage guys, uh, we decided that we didn't get along. We came every year at camp, and it was probably just something superficial that happened like out on the softball field or the basketball court, and you were competing, and you were going back and forth, and we knew who they were, and they knew who we were, but we just had that little, you know, friction, probably just teenage egos or whatever else. It comes down to the very last week of camp. We're always in the same, you know, dorm and everything else, and the last night of camp, whatever happened, we all got together in the same common area in the dorm and started hanging out and talking. And we talked for probably two, three hours into the wee hours of the morning. And we realized we had all kinds of things in common. But we had decided that we were going to look at other people and look at differences because of how they looked or how they act or where they were from and not come together. And I remember literally saying, we have wasted like the last three years because we could have had a blast every year. But instead, we excluded each other. And we're like, man, what did we do that for? We do it sometimes on accident, sometimes it may be on purpose, but we know exclusion always causes problems, and it's one of the main problems that we have in life. Uh, I think we can all agree that a great deal of damage is done because of exclusion. In Jesus' day, there was a lot of reasons for exclusion as well. Uh, whenever it came to what Jesus, you know, came into as far as the world, the world was split in a lot of different ways. There was a lot of different divisions between people. Uh, the Romans ruled so much of the world. If you're a Roman citizen and you had special privileges, if you weren't, you were a second-class citizen and you were never going to quite fit in like everybody else. Whenever it came to Israel, there was going to be divisions within that nation of Israel. You had the Jews, and right north of Judea was going to be Samaria, and there was going to be divisions. They had differences because of their background, because of their upbringing, because of their religious beliefs, and there were all those different divisions between them. 
even when you had all of the Jews together, there was going to be divisions in there. You had Hellenistic Jews who had sort of accepted a lot of the Greek culture that had been, uh, you know, that had sort of come with the uh, Roman rule and all the different things. So they spoke Greek and they did a lot of those things. And then you had Jews like Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews. They were going to keep to the Hebrew language and a lot of those old customs. So even within the Jews, there was going to be this division. There were people that were going to come from an urban place like Jerusalem in the big city, and then there was going to be people like that old small village of Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? So you have big city, and you have small city, and you have all the different reasons that there would be a division. There were social classes in Jesus' day, just like today, that were really a big source of division. There were the rich people, like the rich young ruler, Zacchaeus. There were poor people who were begging for their existence because they were blind or they were lame. They were down in their luck. There were people who, because of sickness, lepers who were simply outcast because of the disease that they had. You had the people that were educated. And they were there and they were learned members of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem that studied God's law and knew all these things. And then they had these unlearned and ignorant fishermen from Galilee that comes down and is trying to tell them something about Jesus. So you had the educated and the uneducated and all those differences. Uh, there was all kinds of divisions that people used to exclude other people. Uh, last week we started talking about the greatness of the church. We saw the greatness in its origin and its foundation in the relationship that it brings and its beginning. Tonight I want to talk to you about the greatness of the church on another level and that's its universality. It is a universal thing where everyone is meant to fit in. Open up to Galatians chapter 3 once again because that's going to be the core text that we're going to look at in our study tonight. That whenever Jesus came, see God knows what we need. And what all of us need is we need to fit in. We need a place where we belong. We need a place where we know others are there for us. We need a place where we are loved. We need a place where we have things in common that we're going to share. We need people to walk through life with. We need, uh, we need a place where when the world excludes us, we have a place where we always fit in. And Jesus came, and that's why he came to build his church. And it was going to be available for everyone. All of these divisions we're going to go away. Many people believe Galatians was the earliest letter written by Paul to the church, and in it he's going to talk about the universality of the church, how everybody was supposed to be there, and I believe this makes the church uh, so great today. Galatians 3, verse 26. So in Christ you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither slave nor free, there is, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul is talking to these Christians, and as he is sending this letter, what he wants them to understand is, look, when it comes to the church, it is something that's going to be different than what you've had from the beginning of time. You go back, and even whenever the Israelites were let out, they were going to be the Jewish nation, and it was going to be Abraham's seed that were going to be blessed, and the Jews took great pride in that, but you were going to be a Jew, and you were going to follow that Old Testament law, and even part of that law was how they were going to keep themselves separate and distinct. One of the most difficult things that people in the New Testament in the early first century were going to have to learn was, no, the church is now going to make this huge paradigm shift where everybody, everybody is going to belong. And for Paul, who was raised as that educated Jew that was so ready to exclude everybody else, if you had known him as a young man and then you read these verses, you would say, what did he just say? There is no way because he was raised to exclude so many different people. But here he says, once the church comes, there is a major change. Paul explains to all Christians that one of the purposes of the church is to make us all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 26, what does he say? We are all members of the family of God. We are all children of God through faith. The thing that's going to allow everybody to come together, the thing that's going to make it universal is this is what we need you to do in order to be a part of the church is you are going to have faith. 
what we do in every way is based on the faith in Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We, can, we believe that he has come to save us from our sins. And everyone who has that faith in him has an opportunity to be a part of this family and to be children of God, as we talked about. He goes on to say in verse 27, whenever we come and we come to follow him, he says, all of you, one of the things that made them all be one, he says, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. The thing that makes this universal where it brings everybody together is you have all kinds of different people. And Joe mentioned that this morning in the lesson when he was talking about the church there in Antioch. And you sort of study through the different names of the people that were there. They were from all over the place. A lot of different people, people that were from northern Africa. You had a lot of different folks that came together. And whenever they came together there in Antioch, they were all together. Even though they looked different, even though they had different backgrounds and different customs, they were all the same. Well, what was the things they shared together? Well, they all had faith in Jesus. And the second thing that every Christian in Scripture had in common was we were all baptized together. And when we were baptized, we were clothed together with Christ. What made them all together? They were baptized. Well, have you done that? Well, that's what they had all done. They had all made the decision that they were going to be buried with Jesus and going to be raised to walk in a new life. And I like the way that he phrases it. He says what they did was they clothed themselves with Christ. One of the things that makes people feel like they are together in something is what they wear. Isn't that funny? You go back to the ancient of times and if men were putting on war paint, they were going to be putting on war paint to show which side they were on. You sit there and look at Roman legions and what were they doing? They were going to have a uniform. They were going to have, the hat. They were going to have their helmets. They were going to have things that looked the same. You go through the 17 and 1800s and all the different armies that would come across from England or France or what, they were all going to be in uniform. Why? We're all the same. We are together. We're marching in the same direction. We all have the same goal. Whenever it gets in the middle of a conflict, we know which side we're on. And that always happens. Today, huge market selling jerseys. And what's the idea? The teams that are playing together, the jersey represents them, represents them together, and the fans even want to jump in and say, I want to wear something that shows I'm identifying with these individuals. Well, what happens within the church? He says, there is something that we are all clothed with, something that says I belong, something that says I am a part of that. But what we had was we have the opportunity to be buried with Christ and to put him on. We could spend the rest of the night talking about the blessings that come because I am covered with Jesus Christ. When God looks at me, I am clothed with him and the righteousness that he brings. But he says, look, this is going to bring everybody together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 talked about what happened whenever this action took place. It was available to anyone who would come in faith. Anyone who would believe could come and, and go through this transformation. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 tells us, We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. You see this seeking one time and again. Everybody's going to be, can be included. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Baptism was this unifying thing that everybody said, are you a Christian? Yes, well, and Paul, as he's there in Acts chapter 18, he meets a group of, uh, 19 a groups of disciples. And as he's talking to them about the spirit that you see they're all to drink from, he says, well, hey, tell me about your baptism. It was something that they all came together. And whenever they saw that in Acts 19, that, hey, well, they had missed out on exactly what God wanted on baptism. And to begin that chapter, you see a group of 12 guys that say, oh, okay, no, I want to share in the same baptism that everybody else did in the name of Jesus Christ, and they did that. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, as he was talking to him once again, he says, look, there's a lot of differences, but all these are eliminated as we come together. In chapter 2, he had talked about how they also had gone through this baptism in verse 12. But in chapter 3, verse 9, he says, don't lie to one another since you have taken off your old self with its practices. And it put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What was he telling them? We're all having the chance to be together. There's not Jew or Gentile, and we see that and we hear it and it doesn't affect us much. But man, for those early Christians, Jews their entire life 
It said, look, you keep yourself pure. You're only going to be marrying other Jews when it comes to worship and going to the temple. Only Jews can go into that temple courtyard. Gentiles aren't going to come. Now, they can come and become a proselyte, and they can start following God, but they're never going to be on equal footing. The fact that you are a Jew is all that mattered, and all of this goes away when Jesus comes and builds his church. What does he do? He breaks down that middle wall, this barrier that has separated them, and you see that again in Colossians 2 as well. Jesus opens the church up to everybody. Uh, We don't think a whole lot about the fact that anybody can become a member of the Lord's church. But so many times in the history of man, there have been barriers to keep people away. Those in early in Christianity uh, thought a lot about it. Whenever he comes and tells them there in verse 28, he says, when he goes through all the differences... That Jew and Gentile is no longer a difference that's going to exclude people. That was difficult for many people to take. Uh, Ethnicity, he tells them, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you're coming from or what you look like. Those things no longer matter. Isn't that what Jesus really said when he gave the Great Commission? He came and he was going to speak to the Jews. And then he says, but as he sends everybody out, Matthew 28, what does he say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This was no longer going to be limited to the children of Israel. It was going to be to go into all of the world. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes, whoever has that faith, and whoever is baptized, who puts on Christ, will be saved. But whoever does not will be condemned. Uh, It is really beautiful when you see this happening. When you see all the exclusions come to an end and people start to come together, it's an amazing thing. Uh, Joe, I, we, Natalie and I were listening to the 10 o'clock service as we were driving down Interstate 40 this morning and listening to Joe's lesson as he was talking about it. And as Joe was ta- talking, I thought, man, that's exactly what happened in the church in Athens when we were there. And then Joe brought up the church in Athens, and I said, that's exactly right. It's amazing going all over the world and seeing different people that come from all over. And we went there, and they had the Greek service, and we just shook our heads and... Okay, we didn't know what they were saying. But then it came to the English service. And there are people from all over northern Africa. There's a school there where guys are learning to preach. And they're coming from Kenya and coming from Liberia and coming from all kinds of different places. You had people there that were uh, a number of ladies that were Asian ladies that had come over. And they were working and cleaning houses. But they had found the church. You had that one guy that came from Pakistan. And he was a lawyer in Pakistan. And when he became a Christian, he had to get out of there. And he was there going to school studying so he could learn how to tell other people about Jesus. And it was the most beautiful melting pot of people from totally diverse places. And as they read these verses, they're like, you know what, we're all the same. We come together and everybody in here looks very similar. But as you go throughout the world and you see people coming together, you see just how beautiful the church is. I think we have a lot of room to grow when it comes to diversity, when it comes to making sure that anybody, and we've got a community that's becoming more and more diverse, and what do we need to do? We need to become diverse with the community. We need to find people who will have faith, find people who want to be clothed with Christ, and welcome them to this family. But it's neat traveling the world and seeing that. And you go to California and you see different people that are Christians and they have the same faith and have had the same baptism. You go to New Zealand and you're there and you see a guy in New Zealand. I remember he came from Netherlands. Like, how do you get from the Netherlands to New Zealand? He probably thought, how do you get to New Zealand from Tennessee? You know, but anyways, you have all these different people. And in the Bahamas, when we went there for years on those mission trips, you see these beautiful people and these beautiful children and all these different folks from different cultures doing different things. And you're at home. You're included with all of them immediately. Why? Because we have faith in Christ Jesus. We're all children of God. And when we sit down and open God's word and let it speak to us, we say, I had faith in him and I was clothed with Christ and so are you. And because of that, it doesn't matter where we come from on this globe, we're all together. The church is the only thing in this world that does that that makes immediate family. You can be anywhere. Uh, You know, just, uh, and and how people are there for you at any time. Nathan Hickson, I was looking for Nathan, I'm not sure if he's here tonight or not, but he got stranded in Dallas. 
and just sent out a message. Oh, I'm stranded in Dallas. And he gets a phone call from somebody else and says, Hey, I'm a Christian here in Dallas. I hear you're stuck at the airport coming to pick you up. You stay at my house tonight. Isn't that right? That's the type of thing that we have with the church. Wherever you go, you sit there and you get in trouble and you're on a trip and you just look up the Lord's church and you make a call to somebody. And what happens? You've got help anywhere. You've got God's people. Why? Because we're all, we're all included. And it's such a blessing. And that's what God came to make. In the Old Testament, there was a lot of different things that got people excluded. You see, a lot of times as Jesus is working with folks, they brought up sinners, and they were even going to point out sinners and say, these individuals are going to be excluded because of their sins. And they like to put people out because of that. But if they'll have faith in Jesus, he's going to show that sinners don't have to be excluded. They can be included. Slavery was a part of life in those days. That was what happened. But within Christianity, Paul tells them it doesn't matter right now if you are the property of somebody else or not. It doesn't matter if you are slave or free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. The most important thing about you is that we, you can be one in Christ. A lot of times in, the, in Jesus' day and today, poor people are excluded. The poor would be excluded by common people, but the poor were meant to have a place in the church. You can see Jesus' care for the poor a lot of different times. As he talked to the rich young ruler, we mentioned that a couple weeks ago. He said, well, give away also, just give it to the poor, and then you have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. You see Zacchaeus, I don't know what all Jesus talked to Zacchaeus about, but what does he say? Half of what I have, I'll give to the poor. I think that there was a repeated thing that happened with Jesus was, hey, when you see poor folks, take care of them, include them. John the Baptist uh, in Matthew chapter 11 is questioning what exactly is going on, and we could go into the background of that, but he's in prison, and he's thinking, is Jesus really the Messiah? And it looks like he's sort of having a time where he's doubting, and he sends some of his disciples to be like, Jesus, are you really the one or not? And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 5, Jesus says, Go tell John what you're seeing. He says, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. One of the characteristics of Jesus' teaching was we want everybody to come and we don't, don't matter. it doesn't matter what they bring to the table except for their eternal soul. So you could have other people say, look, we want to get a bunch of people, but we want people that have money or we want people that have influence. We want all these things. What is a poor person going to bring? And Jesus says a poor person is going to bring something that's more valuable than the whole world because that person has an eternal soul and I want to reach them. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is there in Nazareth, and he's reading. And as he sits down to read, he's reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And this was the prophecy about this is going to show what the church was going to be about when it came. And this is what he reads in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. It's just a quotation from Isaiah 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is going to close that scroll and hand it back and say, today it's fulfilled. Jesus came to proclaim the good news to the poor. And as his church, as a church that wants to be universal in every way, I think we have a lot of room to grow when it comes to taking care of the poor. I know I do. So as we see individuals and we see people in need and we see people that have problems, we have to understand that, look, the church is universal. And Jesus is going to tell them a number of times, you know, when the girl comes and anoints his foot, they start complaining, well, that could have been sold and they could have helped out a lot of different people. And Jesus will say, the poor you'll have with you always. And that's always going to be true. But you know what will also be true? God's people will always preach and reach out to help the poor. We're called to make sure everyone can be involved. What else did Paul say? He said there's not male or female. 
male and female roles within that society was going to be very different. Women were going to be second class in a lot of different ways. They couldn't hold certain jobs. They may not be able to own property. There was a lot of things where a woman was not going to be elevated. A lot of times in, in Jesus' time across the world, women could be property and wives wouldn't have any rights and all these other things that were wrong. But he comes here in Galatians and says, you know what's going to happen within the church? We are all one. There is no second class. There's different roles and different things that people are going to do. But within Christ, what's important? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Have you been buried with him in the waters of baptism? And he says, you know what happens within the church? It is universal that every man or woman can come and share in that exact same blessing, that exact same faith, have that exact same position in the sight of God, and inherit the exact same blessings from the relationship with God. That was going to be very different. And Christianity came, and wherever Christianity has gone into the world, the value that's placed on women, because we see that that's God's special creation at the end of time, all the way back in Genesis, to the position that they can hold within the church, is that there is no male or female. It's about our eternal soul. And what is happening? Faith and putting Christ on. And he talks about the importance of it. What happens? Jesus' saving power is equally available to everyone on earth. And that's why we can all be one in Christ. He then says in verse 29, when we become children, we're also heirs. Everyone who had faith in Jesus Christ was a son of Abraham and an heir to the promise that God had made to him. Abraham came and because of his faith, he was the father of the faithful. And God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And the whole world's going to be blessed through you and through your seed. And Paul says, you know what's happened that brings us all together. What is universal in this world is if anyone will come to God based on faith, we can all be children of Abraham as well. It's no longer about our ethnicity. It's not whether or not we came from a tribe of Jews. It was going to be whether or not we had that faith in him. Exclusion was over. And the universality of the church had arrived, and I believe that made the church great. And that's what we're to be as well. Well, what can we do to replicate? I just have a couple suggestions for you. Four of them as we think about us becoming the church that we're seeing in Scripture. Number one, let's make sure that we remove man-made barriers that cause other people to feel excluded. Let's make sure we remove man-made barriers, not what God says, but what we do and what we see to make others feel excluded. I think every one of us have a great challenge to make sure that when people come here, they can feel like there's a place for them. We need to make sure that others can come and be welcomed. We need to make sure that as others come, we see how we can get them involved. How can we spend time with them? How can we have events that would make other people come together to say, look, I fit in here. Uh, that's, I believe, one of Southgate's great, Southgate, I did it again. Uh, Southgate's great strengths is collecting people in and let them spend in that time together. My favorite part this weekend at CYC is that Ben went around with a big silver bowl and he made every kid put their phone in it. You know the bravery that it takes to gather up the phones of 40 young people. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Actually, they didn't do too bad. I didn't see. I thought they were going to string him up, and I was going to see how far they'd take it. But he took all those things up. We weren't going to go into town, and we just hung out, and we had a lot of different games, and they all ran around different places, playing games, doing activities, just having a good time together. And because all those distractions were gone, you had kids that were different ages with different interests from different schools, from all kinds of different places, and what were they doing? They were just having a great time together. And that's what the church is about. It's about coming together and saying, look, there's something that we have all in common, this faith we have in Jesus Christ. We're all together with him. We've been clothed with him. But we have to get rid of things that separate us. Sometimes that's distraction. Sometimes that's our schedule. And I need to just say, nope, this Thursday night, I'm going to have some folks over. I'm going to make sure that I do something to make sure others know that they're included. And let's take that challenge. Number two, let's come together on God-made expectations that will allow us to come together. Whenever you want to be with somebody else, you have to find common ground. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit when it comes to the church. The common ground that brings us all together is not our opinions or what we like, but what God has said. So that common ground that we have is looking to his word. 
to make sure that we can come together on what he said. And let's unify by standing on that word. He tells us what to do, and we're going to do our best to honor him by doing it. We're going to let him be our guide, and we're going to let him hold us together. And that's the way that we can come together. And finally, I would say this. Let's unify on the beautiful promise of God. In Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you belong to Christ tonight? The invitation that Jesus gives us is you can be a part of this family. It's available for everyone. Do you believe? If you believe, then make a decision. Make a decision to come and say, I'm going to turn away from sin. I'm going to be united just like every other Christian always has been with Jesus in the waters of baptism. I'm going to have my sins washed away and I'm going to rise up to live a new life in a place where everybody has all things in common and try to invite as many people to the same promise as I possibly can. If you're ready to do that tonight, we're ready to help you. Uh, we will celebrate with you in every way. Tonight, maybe you have other needs. Uh, you need your family to know. Know that we want to be here for you. But sometimes we have to engage. We have to let other people know that, look, I'm struggling right now. Until uh, you let us know, we're unable to be the help that we want to be. So maybe tonight you have a need for that. But if we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we stand. As we stand.